So I've driven like 45 minutes or so oh to uh, oh. stare at the sun. Gotta, I gotta put on these things that I can't see out of and look up. Oh, it's happening. Wow. I cannot see out of these things, but I can, I can see the moon and the sun. That's insane. So they say that it's supposed to be dangerous to, to put your camera to the sun, but I don't know. I feel like it's not. I, I don't feel like it's really gonna be that dangerous. I'm gonna try it. I hope I don't break my phone. Oh, I can see it in there. Looks like it's still working. So it's like five minutes out, and you can see it's set off sensors for lights. Street lights are on. I'm gonna just let this thing roll as it gets dark. It's just a tiny little sliver right now. Alright, it's now story time with Nathan. Gather around kiddos because today we're reading The Lorax by Dr. Seuss. Yes, it's published by Random House. At the far end of town where the grickle grass grows, and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows, and no birds ever sing excepting old crows, is the street of the lifted lorax. Deep in the grickle grass, some people say, if you look deep enough, you can still see today where the Lorax once stood just as long as it could before somebody lifted the Lorax away. To whom the arch enemy, and thence in heaven called Satan, with bold words breaking the horrid silence, thus began. If thou beest he, oh, what how fallen, how changed from him, who in the happy realms of light clothed, with transcendent brightness didst outshine myriads though bright, if he whom mutual league united thoughts and counsels equal hope and hazard in the glorious enterprise. Joined with me once, now misery hath joined in equal ruin. Into, uh, into what pit thou seest, from what height fallen, so much the stronger proved he with his thunder, till then who knew the force of those dire arms? Yet not for those, nor what the port, the potent victor in his rage can else inflict. Do I repent or change, though changed in outward luster that fixed mind, and high disdain from sense of injured merit. That with the mightiest raised me to contend, and to the force contention brought along innumerable force of spirits armed. That durst dislike his reign, and me preferring his utmost power with adverse power reposed in dubious battle on the plains of heaven, and shook his throne, what though the field be lost. All is not lost, the unconquerable will, and study of revenge, immortal hate, and courage never to submit or yield. And what else is not to be overcome? That glory shall, shall his wrath, or never shall his wrath or might extort from me to bow and sue for grace, with suppliant knee and deify his power who from the terror of his arms so late doubted his empire, that were low indeed, that were an ignominy and shame beneath this downfall, since by faith the strength of gods and this imperial substance cannot fail. In arms, uh, since through experience of this in great... Since through this experience of this great event, in arms not worse, in foresight much advanced, we may with more successful hope resolve to wage by force or guile eternal war, irreconcilable to our grand foe, who now triumphs and in the excess of joy sole reigning holds the tyranny of heaven. As Atticus departed, Dill came bounding down the hall into the dining room. It's all over town this morning, he announced, all about how we held off a hundred folks with our bare hands. Aunt Alexandra stared him into silence. It was not a hundred folks, she said, and nobody held anybody off. It was just a nest of those old Cunninghams, drunk and disorderly. Ah, uh, Auntie, that's just Dill's way, said Jim. He, he signaled us to follow him. You all stay in the yard today, she said as we made our way to the front porch. It was like Saturday. People from the south end of the county passed our house in a leisurely but steady stream. 
Mr. Dolphus Raymond lurched by on his thoroughbred. I don't see how he stays in the middle, m murmured Jim. How can you stand to get drunk four eight in the morning? The bourgeoisie, by the rapid improvement of all instruments of production, by the immensely fast facilitated means of communication, draws all, even the most barbarian nations, into civilization. The cheap prices of its commodities are the heavy artillery with which it batters down all Chinese walls with which it forces the barbarians' intensely obstinate hatred of foreigners to capitulate. It compels all nations on pains of extinction to adopt the bourgeois mode of production. It compels them to introduce what it calls civilization into their midst, i.e. to become bourgeois themselves. In one word, it creates a world after its own image. The bourgeoisie has subjected the country to the rule of the towns. It has created enormous cities, greatly increased the urban population as compared with the rural and thus rescued a considerable part of the population from the idiocy of rural life. Just as it has made the, count, the country in, uh, dependent on the towns, so it has made barbarian and semi-barbarian countries uh, dependent on the civilized ones, nations of peasants on nations of bourgeoisie, the east on the west. More and more, the bourgeoisie continues to do away with the shattered state of population, means of production, and property. I lost my place again. Coward, deserter, traitor. Coward, deserter, traitor. One by one they shouted, Coward, deserter, traitor. And vanished. Jesus rotated his eyes with anguish and looked. He was alone. The yard and house, the trees, the village doors, the village itself, all had disappeared. Nothing remained but stones beneath his feet, stones covered with blood, and lower, further away, a crowd, thousands of heads in the darkness. He tried with all his might to discover where he was, who he was, and why he felt pain. He wanted to contemplate his cry, to shout, Lama Sabachthani. He attempted to move his lips, but could not. He grew dizzy and was ready to faint. He seemed to be hurling downward and perishing. But suddenly, while he was falling and perishing, someone on the ground must have pitied him, for a reed was held out in front of him, and he felt a sponge soaked in vinegar rest against his lips and nostrils. He breathed in deeply the bitter smell, and revived, swelling in his breast. He swelled his breast, looked at the heavens, and uttered a heart-rending cry, Lama Sabatani. Then he immediately inclined his head, exhausted. He felt terrible pains in his hands, feet, and heart. His sight cleared, he saw the crown of thorns, the blood, the cross. Two golden earrings and two rows of sharp, brilliantly white teeth flashed in the darkened sun. He heard a cool, mocking laugh, and rings and teeth vanished. Jesus remained hanging in the air, alone. Uh, Scott's unflinching portrayal of a controversial military leader shows him as he was, beloved and despised, Charismatic and confrontation. General Patton was a brilliant strategist, a pious man who swore up a storm, and his who swore up a storm, and his skill led the United States into the most famous and pivotal battles of the war in Europe. Okay, and then uh, as you can see, there are several pages of just a giant squid uh, lying on top New York City. No real dialogue going on here, nothing to read to you, just a stronger loving world. Well, that pretty much speaks for itself. But now, says the Wunstler, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to change. It's not. This has been Storytime with Naya. Thank you. Oh. 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 Oh.